All right, it is recording. Welcome, you guys. Welcome back. So you can see our title there, The Body and the Bride. And you will need to turn, as it says in the bottom right there, to Genesis chapter 24 for tonight, because that's a, a rather lengthy chapter, and I don't have it all in the slides. The rest of the scriptures I do have, but if you want to go ahead and, and turn, we'll be reading that early in the night. So, we're going to talk more about the body and the bride. And we're going to talk about Genesis chapter 24, as it says there, finding the bride. That's what's uh, really neat. It's a really neat story in Genesis 24. But we're not just going to read it on the surface level. You know how we do things now. We look underneath and see what the scripture is really trying to give us. So, if you've read Genesis 24 in the past, just uh, bear with us. Let's go through and, and see if we can find uh, all of the pieces that the Spirit would have for us. So, the body and the bride. This is part two. Let's open with a word of prayer. Abba, we love you and we welcome you into our home. We thank you for allowing us to meet, Father, in your word and, and for the giving our friends and family the opportunity to come together safely and, and uh, that we can sit here, Father, and block the world outside and lock ourselves into your word. And, and Father, we pray for open hearts and minds that you would show us the message you would have us receive tonight, Father. Bless our learning. Bless our growing in the grace and knowledge of your Son, Yeshua, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, the body and the bride. Uh, this being part two, I did not put a lot of review from part one in here. And I'm going to try to do that on purpose because of the time. Uh, you know, last week I told you that it's going to take at least two and maybe three lessons. I think now it's probably going to take three to four, maybe even a fifth one. And, and, and so because of that, I'm not putting a lot of review. Uh, if you did miss part one, it's available. Please uh, go get it off of uh, the GodTube or the YouTube page. This slide, however, was in part one, and this is the only review that we're going to do from part one. Bottom line up front, if you don't know what bluff stands for, bottom line up front, this being a long series of, of message or lesson, uh, but I'm going ahead and giving away the punchline. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced from what we've read in Scripture and from what the Spirit has given us that the body of Christ and the bride of Christ are two different things. And like I said last week, uh, relatively facetiously, if for nothing else, they, they have two different titles. Uh, they wouldn't have two different titles if they weren't two different things. But, uh, but that's the obvious. The point of the lesson is to look at the not so obvious. So let's explore a little bit deeper. The Shad Khan, now this is a Hebrew word. What we learned in the first lesson was uh, that God was the first Shad Khan or, the, or matchmaker. We saw that happen in Genesis, uh, early in Genesis with Adam and Eve. And we talked about all of that last week. There's another matchmaking story in Genesis chapter 24, which is the focus of tonight's lesson in part 2. Abraham's servant acted in Genesis 24 as a matchmaker, modeled after the Heavenly Father, and found a suitable bride for Abraham's son, Isaac. And if you notice, his name here is Abraham. The, uh, his wife's name has been changed from Sarai to Sarah. And in both of those, if you look at the name change, Sarai went to Sarah. And we have an H sound added, appended to the end of her name. Abram went from that to Abraham. And again, we have another H sound in, instantiated there in his name. And what that is, is it's a, it's a hey. It, it's a hey sound, a wind, a breath sound, as in God breathed into them the breath of life, a part and essence of himself when he did that. And you'll see tonight we will talk about the Ruach HaKodesh. Even as you say the word Ruach, you can hear and feel the wind leaving your lungs as you speak that word. It's kind of like uh, also another way to say it is the pneuma, the, uh, where we get the English word pneumatics for a tire that's filled with air, for example, is a pneumatic tire. Uh, it is all uh, from the original Hebrew and Greek words that are discussing the Holy Spirit. So I, I find that interesting that, to note that by the time we get to Genesis 24, God has changed their names but he's actually changed their essence by 
putting something in their name to signify himself. So that's uh, just kind of a little sidebar. Let's move on. Let's go straight to Genesis 24. And we're going to read from top to bottom. It's a long read, but we're going to get through this because it's important that we understand everything that's happening in this story. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and Yahweh had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. And that's a very important phrase. Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by Jehovah, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Now I want to do a little commentary here. He's asked his servant to put his hand under his thigh. And what this was was a customary thing. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's wrong that people misunderstand what's going on here because if you build the mental picture, it doesn't look right in our society for, for what these two are doing. But in reality, this is an older custom. This is a way that the servant with his hands underneath the thighs of Abraham is if I could use this term, he's swearing in the greatest form that he can to Abraham to obey his command here. That's what he's, that's what he's doing here. That's why Abraham is putting him into this position. So if we lived back in these days, it wouldn't at all be uncomfortable or, or unusual to us. Uh, verse 4, But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure, and I, I, that's one of my favorite words in the King James. Peradventure, I find myself using it sometimes. Uh, you know, what if is, is what that means, okay? Uh, what if the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land? Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? Or should I take your son back there? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou not bring my son thither again. And, and Jehovah God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from there. And if the woman will not be willing to follow you, then thou shalt be clear of, of your oath. Only bring not my son there again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swore to him concerning the matter. And the servant took ten, cam uh, ten camels of the camels of his master and departed, for all of the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without or outside of the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that you have shown kindness unto my master. And it came to pass before he had done speaking. That behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. Now that right there, guys, that's a big task in and of itself. She, he's got ten camels. And she's going to draw enough water to fill ten camels? Now you think about it. Camels can go a long, long time without drinking. You know how? Because when they find it, they drink a lot. <laughs> So that's quite a task. Anyway, verse 20. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water and drew for all of his camels. And the man wandering at her held his peace to wit whether Jehovah had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass 
as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. And he said, Whose daughter are you? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said, Moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. The man bowed down his head and worshipped Jehovah. And he said, Blessed be Jehovah, the God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man, unto the well. Now why do you think Laban ran out there? Because he's given away gold and, and, and silver and all kinds. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain that first of all it was that. That true nature, There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, verse 30. And it came to pass when he saw the earring and bracelets upon his sister's hands and when he heard the words of Rebekah his sister saying, Thus spake the man unto me that he came unto the man and behold he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in thou blessed of Jehovah. Wherefore standest thou without or outside for I have prepared the house and room for the camels and the man came into the house and he ungirded his camels and gave straw and provender for the camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him and there was set meat before him to eat but he said I will not eat until I have told mine errand and he said speak on and he said I am Abraham's servant and Jehovah hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. Now, I want to take a moment and just a little, another little kind of a sidebar. He's given unto Isaac all that he has. What does that leave for Ishmael? Now, no doubt in earlier in Genesis, God said that he would bless Ishmael. I, I, I understand that. But that does not make Ishmael a part of the inheritance. All right? This goes all the way to our, our website. Jesus is not in the Koran. Uh, Ishmael is not a part of the inheritance. And I want to make sure that, that we understand that. Even here in Genesis 24, we read that Abraham has given all that he has to his son Isaac. In other words, the inheritance goes to his son Isaac. Verse 37, And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, Jehovah, before whom I walk, will send his angel with you and prosper your way and you take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house then shall thou be clear from this oath when thou comest to my kindred and if they give not thee one thou shalt be clear from my oath and I came this day unto the well and I said O Jehovah God of my master Abraham if now thou do prosper my way which I go behold I stand by the well of water and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water and I say to her give me I pray thee a little water of thy pitcher to drink and she say to me both drink thou and I will also draw for thy camels let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son and before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down into the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her and, and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelets upon her hands. And I bowed down my head and worshipped Jehovah and blessed Jehovah, the God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's bro uh, brother's daughter unto his son. And now if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. And so, you know, that, that's, that's the proposal right there, guys. That's, if you'll deal with him, you know, tell me. And if not, tell me. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from Jehovah. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. 
Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as Jehovah has spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped Jehovah, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave also, uh, excuse me, also gave to her brother and to her mother precious things. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten. After that she shall go. But he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing Jehovah hath prospered my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and, their, and, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah. And they said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions. <laughs> That's a lot. You know, a thousand million is a billion. So what they just said was, Be thou the mother of billions. <laughs> And let your seed possess the gate of those which hate them. And uh, there's also more to the Isaac versus Ishmael and the inheritance right there uh, in verse 60. Verse 61, And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode uh, upon the camels, and followed the man, and the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac, and I want you to mentally note verse 62, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said, uh, for she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh into the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. Now I want you to notice a couple of things are happening here. Number one, she lighted off, she got off the camel. And number two, she took a veil and covered herself. But it says she lighted off the camel, but then the very next sentence says, Because she had asked and had been told that this was the master's son. She didn't simply get off of the camel out of coincidence. She got out, off of the camel and then covered herself with a veil out of respect for his position. She had been told his stature. She had been told, if you would, his rank. She got off in an attitude of um, servitude. Uh, what's the word? She got off in an attitude of etiquette. Because the one coming to meet her was the master's, serv uh, the master's son of whom she had heard. He's very, very high ranking, if you would. So this is an attitude of respect is what she's, what she's giving here. Verse 66, And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And this is what Brother Sonny was talking about. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, who's been dead for several chapters now. Actually about three years is how long Sarah has been dead. And he took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So that's first, uh, excuse me, chapter 24. A beautiful chapter. I think second only to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, as you know, the Akedah, the offering of Isaac. Actually, the, the Hebrew word Akedah is the binding of Isaac. And uh, so this, these two chapters are beautiful chapters. So let's talk just a little bit about the Shad Khan and then speaking of Genesis 22, we're going to go and take a look at that a little bit. I have the rest of the verses up on the slides though. So Abraham, having realized that the Canaanite women whom he lived among were morally unsuitable, sent his servant to find the perfect match from among his own family and of his father's house. What you just witnessed in verse 62, I asked you to make a mental note there, was Isaac's reappearance in Scripture after what had occurred in Genesis chapter 22. As you see there, the, the Akedah. Let's take a look at that. This is a, an incredibly fascinating piece of Scripture that I want you to understand. So, in Genesis chapter 22, now we're not going to read this entire chapter, but I want to show you some very key verses from Genesis chapter 22. Starting with verse 2, and he said, Take now thy son, this is of course Jehovah speaking to Abraham. 
take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Now, a little bit of commentary again on the difference between Isaac and Ishmael. In God's eyes, which is all that matters, Isaac is Abraham's only son. Paul clarifies that a little bit later for us in, the, in his New Testament writings of uh, ver, uh, speaking about the son of the, the free versus the son of the slave or the bond. But in God's eyes here, he says, take your son, your only son. That also uh, rings true to John 3.16, does it not? Okay, so that's very important. However, look at the next part that I've gotten underlined here. Whom thou lovest. Do you know that that is the first place in Scripture that the word love shows up? That is the very first place and it is, it is such a pointer to John 3.16 uh, to, to talk about what God did for us uh, through His Son Jesus Christ. Uh, which, of course, is actually where we're going with this entire lesson tonight when, with our examination of Genesis 24 and 22. So. To read the verse again without all the commentary. Jehovah said to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now can you imagine being Abraham and hearing the God that, whom you've never disobeyed, the God that you love, the God that you serve, the God in whom you trust, telling you to do such an awful thing. If we don't examine Scripture and understand why God has done this, then it can look like a very bad thing. As a matter of fact, you guys know that I work a lot with, this, uh, with, with Islam and showing the difference between the God of the Bible and the God of Islam. And one of the things that I read about often from the Islamic point of view is that they say uh, they will use this verse as an example of God approving of child sacrifice. When nothing could be farther from the truth, all you have to do is keep reading and we will see and commentate a little bit on God's exact intentions here. Sometimes God is just using the language that He does to make us realize the gravity of the situation. God does not in any way, as we spoke of last week, reference abortion and passing your seed through the fire to Moloch, approve of child sacrifice. So let's continue on. Genesis 22, 2, let's go another, I think this is 3. Verse 3, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, and he took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. So Abraham just immediately rises up and goes. He knows not where he's going, but he knows he's been told to go. He knows what his mission is, so he takes two servants and Isaac his son and the wood for the burnt offering. Verses 5 and 6, And Abraham said unto his young men, and this is where you really need to start paying attention. Abide ye here. They're at the bottom of the mountain now. Abide you here with the ass. And I and the lad, or I and myself and Isaac, will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. Now let, let's, let's do a little commentary here for just a minute. In Sunday school... How old is Isaac drawn on all of the, the neat little kitty pictures that we see? He's a, he's a young child, right? How many young children that age do you think could carry the wood for a burnt offering? Up a mountain where they're about to go. It helps a lot to really pay attention to Scripture. Isaac, if you go back and do the math, you'll find that Isaac was at least 33 years old at least 33 years old. That's going to be a key number before we're done for the night. So Abraham took... No, let's back up again. What did he say to the two servants? He says, Abide you here, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. All right? Lock that one away. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. Very, very key two verses, especially verse 
6 there. 7 and 8, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and he said, My father, and he said, Here I am. I wonder why we don't do that these days. Hey, Dad, here I am, son. <laughs> he says, Here I am, my son. And, and, and he said, Isaac, that is, uh, Behold the, the fire and the wood. In other words, I see fire and I see wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? He's catching on. He's not a 12-year-old. He's catching on to what's going on. And Abraham said, and I love this verse. It's probably one of the key verses if you don't understand what's happening here. Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. You know, it's, it's true. Uh, a lot of times when I, when I read this, this verse, you can very quickly read this chapter and just look at this and see uh, that Abraham here is kind of, he's just, you know, don't, don't worry about it, son. Let's just keep going. He's got that kind of an attitude. His son's catching on. You can see Abraham's face. He's like, uh-oh, what do I say? Uh, don't, don't worry, son. God will provide it. But that's not what Scripture says. What Scripture specifically says is that God will provide himself. He also shows me that Abraham and Sarah raised their child well. Oh, they did indeed. In the ways of God. Amen. Because Abraham knew that what God had promised and that one, he wouldn't kill him, but if he did allow him to take then, then he would have to bring him back. So he'd have That's to right. And also, they had taught their son so well, their son also had to know that while he questioned, okay, we don't have anything, he had to know what his father meant. God will provide no matter what. Right. And that sentence is what we all need to think of daily, monthly, whatever. Oh, you're right. You're so right. That, know that yeah. even if God takes something away from us that we just feel like in our soul, he has told us to do and promised us to do that he's going to do, that even if he takes it away, he will give it back. You think about your house ministry. He didn't take it away, but it went away. I mean, you know, it went away, you did it else, you know, you, you sort of did it. Mm -hmm. But he gave it back to you. And in a lot of ways, I'm sure it's more precious and even better now than it was. Sure. And think about Job. And At the end of Job, everything was doubled unto Job. If you go seriously to the beginning of Job chapter 1 and look at the numbers of all the animals that he had and then go to the end and it says it was doubled and sure enough if you did the math it's doubled except for the children. He had seven sons and three daughters and at the end he was given seven sons and three daughters. Why weren't they, why wasn't he given fourteen sons and six daughters? Because the seven sons and three daughters are, are in heaven. They have eternal life. So actually they were doubled. Everything was doubled. And you're exactly right. So this is a good time to bring this up. You mentioned in there that Abraham and the way he had raised Isaac was through his own personal ministry with God. Abraham was well aware that God, before Genesis 22, had promised to, to, to increase his seed through Isaac. So, in other words, at this point, if God's going to kill Isaac, God's got the problem, not Abraham. So Abraham, Kathy, you're exactly right. Either knows that God is not going to allow him to actually offer him, or he knows he has to bring him back to life. One of the two has to happen. Because another promise has already been given, which hinges on Isaac living past this day. And see, he didn't just show Abraham Isaac having children after him. He went ahead and showed Abraham about a 400 year right. picture into the future. That's right. So he knows that in 400 years of my family heritage going forward, it's going to go. That's right. It's God. <laughs> You're right. Okay, continuing on. So Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Uh, Trisha and I were, were visiting a church one Sunday morning, and I heard the pastor tell a story of a young little girl. And uh, I, I can't remember exactly how the story goes, but she was talking about Genesis 22 and the actual moment when we see later in Genesis 22, we see uh, the lamb that's uh, caught in the thicket. And the little girl had pointed out to the pastor that 
there was the lamb caught in a crown of thorns. And, you know, what a picture it was. Well, when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's a wonderful picture. So I never read Genesis 22 without thinking of that again as well. All the other pictures that are there, the Lamb will see, well, we won't see tonight, but you will see in a thorough reading of Genesis 22 that the offering becomes, uh, shows up captured in a crown of thorns. That's amazing. Okay, so Isaac is getting uh, concerned here of what's going on. Abraham is, is, is well in charge, I believe. Verses 10, and 12, 10 through 12. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, of course, at this time, Isaac's well aware of what's going on. And he has voluntarily uh, agreed to go through with it. So he took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of Jehovah... Now, we talked about this guy last week. The Mimrah. This is, I believe... Not just an angel that God dispatched one of the millions of. I believe that this is the Mimrah, the, the, the actual pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, if you will. This is God in person. And it says, The angel of Jehovah called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, there it is again, from me. Now let me ask you something. God said, Don't do it, for now I know. One of our basic tenets of God in general is that he knows everything. He can't learn, right? We got three L's. He can't lie. He can't learn, and he can't make you love him. Why can't he make you love him? He could, right? He could just snap his fingers. He can't because he said he won't, and we go back to the first part, he won't lie. He can't lie. He can't make you love him because he said he won't make you love him. So he can't lie, he can't learn, and he can't make you love him. That's the three L's, the three things that God cannot do. So how is it that this verse makes it seem as if he learned something. No, he didn't. When, when God says here, for now I know, what that means, guys, is now you know. Now you know Abraham's faith. It's the personification of his faith. Yes, that's right. Later, if you study the scriptures well enough to put the pieces together, when you read of Abraham's faith in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, you put it back to Genesis 22 here, then you can actually experience Abraham's faith. Because what God is saying here is, okay, now you readers in the 21st century, now you know what it's like to truly trust God. And I've heard a Bible teacher that I used to study a lot say this. He's going to try almost every day to find a way to ask you, do you trust me? That's definitely what he's doing with Abraham right now, is he? Isn't he? Do you trust me? Now I know. Say again? And to Andy's point, Isaac. Uh huh. You know, because you spoke of his age, to think that he had faith. Yes. And was obedient enough to get up there. Yep. No, it's a, the, the, the faith on behalf of both of these guys is quite incredible if we think about it. So, yes, ma'am. We've all been married, so this will not be a, in offer, a, a bad question, but it will all apply. I think it will. I hope so. Um, Looking back, all throughout your marriage, your courtship and your marriage, when you, uh, and especially after you know your marriage, uh, each one, husband and wife, ever so often will say, they want to hear, I love you, sure. from the other one. Sure. And sometimes they would say, you know, a woman especially good at this, Love me. Sure. In other words, and they, they just they love to not only hear it, they want to hear you say it so they can see that you're saying it with conviction. Right. I I agree. Good point. Very good. So let, let's, let's just, we kind of did some commentating and discussion there. Let's just read this one again. Verses 10 through 12. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of Jehovah called out, uh, called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So, moving on. 
Verse 19, we're skipping a few verses here. Earlier I told you when Abraham was talking to his servants, he said, I and the lad will go together. And I said, lock that one away in your footlockers. Because when we get to verse 19, after this, of course, between verses 13 to, to 18, we see uh, the sacrificial lamb of which we just spoke caught in the thorns. And of course, they go through with the sacrifice. But what we read when we get to 19, it says, And Abraham returned unto his young men. And they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Notice anything strange about that verse? There's no Isaac. Isaac is not there. We see them go up together. We see Isaac's carrying the wood. We, we, we heard their conversation. We saw uh, you know, the, the stopping point where God said, Okay, now we're done. And now Abraham comes back by himself. Now don't get me wrong. I'm pretty sure that Isaac came down the mountain with him. But that's not what Scripture says. Scripture has purposely edited Isaac out. And let's see if we can figure out why. Alright? A purposeful omission. Isaac is missing in action, to use a military term. From the time we last saw him on the altar, actually we didn't see this verse tonight, but if you went back, you do see him one more time after verse 12 that we looked about. Isaac's name appears in Scripture in Genesis 22, 16. But then you do not see him all the way through Genesis chapter 23 until we see him again in Genesis 24, verse 62, way at the end. Remember when I said, please make a mental note on Genesis 24, 62. You don't see him anymore until he came forth to meet his bride at the end of Genesis 24. Why? Why is it this way in the Scriptures? It's a type or a model of prophecy. Let's continue to look at this, okay? In this story, it's critical that you recognize the players. Now, knowing that it's a type, knowing that what's going on here, and as we discussed, knowing that Abraham knew that he was acting out prophecy, knowing his faith, the faith of Isaac, knowing everything else that's happening here, look at the players as we've put them together. Abraham is a type of God the Father. Isaac, of course, is a type of the Son. And we had the servant who was a type of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're not familiar with the servant and the Spirit as it's been presented in Scripture, you might question that last one. How do we know that the servant is a type of the Holy Spirit? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's, let's look into that. What was the servant's name? As we've read tonight, what was his name? From Genesis chapter 24, what was his name? You won't find it. He was only called servant. You will not find his name given in scriptures. Let's watch this. Back in Genesis chapter 15, in verse 2, And Abram, there's before God has given him his very essence, Abram said, Jehovah God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Now, what does the word Eliezer mean? Have you heard of that one before? Have you heard the title Eliezer? Eliezer means comforter. Eliezer means comforter. Recall that back in these days, people didn't name their children John because dad's name was John. Uh, my, 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 my grandson that was just born, they named him Levi Dale. They named him after me. I love that to death. But the point is, today we name off of what is convenient. Back then, they often named their children because of what the child brought to the family or what circumstances applied to, to the child. Just like Eve said, I'm going to call him this because God has done this. Eliezer's name is the Comforter. You look like you're about to burst. Do you have something to add in here? <laughs> it is such a perfect picture of so much. But it's a perfect picture of, um, of the Comforter did the, uh, was basically did the betrothal, the betrothal part of it. Right. They were betrothed while 
he was not even there. Right. But he was, it was, it was the one who was speaking for him. So right. in essence, he did become betrothed to her. And so he's missing in action in those verses. The comforter is there taking care of everything. That's right. And then he, after that, I and mean, like in the wedding, you know, they get you know, the three parts of the Jewish wedding. The betrothal, then they go away and prepare, and then they come back and have the final right. meetup. And so here it is, and the lady, you know, I, I had never seen that, but it's like this. That's right. And then it comes back together, and it's such a perfect picture it is. of what's happening in the future. That's exactly right. And that's exactly what we are about to summarize. That's very good. So Eliezer becomes a type of the Holy Spirit. You put all of the players together. Now let's wrap this up and see exactly what Miss Kathy's just talking to us about. In John chapter 14, verses 16 through 17, what is it that Jesus told us? He says, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. Why is it that the King James capitalizes the word comforter here? Because it is applied to the Holy Spirit. The, as we spoke of earlier, the Ruach HaKodesh, the, the Spirit of God. I will pray the Father and He will give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, if you had any doubt as to what the comforter was, there's your de definition. Who the world cannot receive because at seeing him not, neither knowing him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So this is where we see that the fact that Jesus is telling this that plainly here that he is going to go away. And the comforter, the Holy Spirit, is going to be here in his place. Let's put all of this together. What does all of this mean then? This depicts how the Holy Spirit is to seek a bride while Messiah is to remain in heaven with the Father until the time comes for God to restore all things, which we see in the book of Revelation. Just as Abraham's servant had charge over all that he had. We read that, and I asked you to pay particular attention to that verse. He had charge over all that was his master's. So does the Spirit have charge over all of the Father's resources. He is a part of the Godhead, one third of the, the triune God. And so it's amazing how they link together as Miss Kath, Kathy just talked about. Let's look in Acts chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And he shall send Yeshua Messiah, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. This is after his, his being taken away. This is a picture of his going into heaven to stay until the time to restore all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. He's not only spoken it by the mouth of the prophets, but he's buried in the scripture for us to find tonight. And we have. We've seen an, a crystal clear picture. So what does this all mean to us today? In the same way, God the Father sent his helper, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to his family and body of believers to take a bride for his son, Yeshua. You see, the Holy Spirit... Earlier, let me go back now. Let's go back to what John, Jesus said in John chapter 14. I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So think about his playing ground if you would. If he is out looking for a bride for the son... And the world hates him. The world cannot receive him. The world cannot speak to him. Only the body of Christ can receive the Holy Spirit. And it's from the body of Christ, just like we spoke last week about the body of Adam, about Hava, Eve, being taken from the body of Adam. It is from the body of Christ, or the body of Messiah, that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Servant here, will take a bride for the Son. Let's go back forward now that we've reviewed that one more time. 
He invites all who are members of his family to become a member of the bride. In other words, think about Eliezer, the servant, who went to his, uh, Abraham's family. And it says when he arrived was about the time that the women, plural, came to draw water. How many of those women were taken to be the bride? Actually, that's a bad question. Instead of a question, let's just make a statement. A very small portion, it was only one literally, but a very small portion of those women became the bride. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's only a very small rib was taken from Adam. Not a leg, not an arm, a very small, in fact, we used this word last week and I'm going to use it again. A remnant. I will never forget the first time I taught this lesson. When I used the term remnant, several people almost exploded. They hated the fact that I used that term. But it's the truth, folks. Because only a small remnant from the body, whether that be from the body of Abraham or from the body of Messiah, will be chosen or transformed into the bride. Yes, ma'am. It's not one of the definitions of remnant. We have, we, we, a lot of people refer to remnant as what's left over. But in, in olden times, what was actually a remnant was like if you had a whole boat of cloth, you took off the first best pristine part of that and put it aside before you made whatever else you're going to make because if you ever had to repair, replace, or fix something on the original, you had some of the best there was to replace it, that's a, to use it for. That's a, and that most people think of remnant as the leftover no. the remainder. But it is the first, the best. That's a, a fantastic analogy. I've never thought of it that way because I've never worked with materials like that. But I've also equally never thought of the remnant as a leftover piece. It simply means in the, the way that I'm using it, a very small portion. A very small portion. I mean, when Jesus says plainly, few there be that find the way, He means few. He doesn't mean most, guys. Let me tell you, if, if we... I don't want to sound irreverent, and I certainly don't want to make anybody that might be listening to this on the internet angry. But the bottom line is this, guys. If you're sitting in a, a church pew on Sunday morning and there's 5,000 people sitting around you, only a few will find it, find their way to be a member of the bride of Christ. We will not all be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know how she spoke about how the etiquette she used, the manners, the yes. Uh, I heard somebody say the other day that once you, it was important to try to hang on and use such things as that because the, the butler or something said that once you lose them, it's almost impossible to bring them back. I would but agree. It's like if you've got a, a flower or something or some sort of grain or flour in a sieve, if you sift through it, the coarser parts, the coarser one, not the etiquette one, the coarser one will stay in the sieve, but mm -hmm. the finest ones there are are the right. ones that will come through. They're That's the most refined ones. Another very good way to put it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one last analogy, and we'll move on. Paul says that we are in a race, and that we should run the race to what? how many people win the race? Regardless of how many runners there are, only one is the winner. A small remnant, to use the same terminology that we have up until this time. A small portion will win. Everyone else, I, I, I love this, uh, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, who, who stuck this one in my head, and I can't ever lose it. He said, second place is just the first loser. And in this battle, when you consider what a prize it would be to be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, I agree. Second place is the first loser. Although, let me be very clear, if I haven't yet, let me be very clear now. 
There is a delineation between the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, but the body of Christ still belongs to Messiah. They are saved. They are justified by the blood of Messiah. They are in heaven. They are justified. Okay? They, they are winners. Uh, so, so let's not say, you know, let's not stretch that analogy too far. They're uh, by, by no means not a winner. So, that's how we apply that to today. Notice that it is the bridegroom or the bridegroom's father or servant who selected the bride, not vice versa. She didn't run over and say, oh, hey, I see a guy named Isaac. I think I'd like to marry him. The father or the servant were the ones that were involved with the selection of the bride. God is always the one who initiates the love relationship with his bride. Now, I, I, was, I was very clear when I wrote that statement. I wrote it and I rewrote it and I changed it and I, I had Yeshua's name in that second bullet there. And then finally, I, I just took it back out. I went right back to the original the way it was. God... Because I want you to understand that Jesus Christ is God. I, I can't stand folks who say Jesus never claimed to be God. Yes, he did. Jesus is always the one who initiates the love relationship with his bride. The bridegroom is the one who initiates the relationship. He chose and selected us. And I hope that, as, you know, even now in, in just early in part two, well, we're almost done with part two. Uh, I didn't mean that, but early in the series. But especially by the time we finish this series, if you uh, are here with us or listening, watching these on the internet, I hope that you will decide to be a part of us, to throw away man's traditions and denominationalism and so forth, and look at Scripture for solely what God, or the triune God, wants you to be in your relationship with Him and seek, run the race to win, as Paul says, and, and seek to become a member of the bride. We love him because he first loved us, what we read in 1 John, just, just to support the previous slide. But also in John 15 and verse 16, and going back to almost to where we were earlier, Yeshua here, he says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You see, uh, this one... <laughs> Uh, this is one that I'm, I'm quite fond of saying. Nobody just wakes up one morning and says, I think I'll try this Jesus thing. I mean, you can wake up one morning convicted and wanting to give your life over to Him, but you didn't initiate that. He did. No one has ever simply done it of their own accord. You were chosen. I relayed this story just this morning in a conversation I had with a pastor on the phone. Uh, but I, I remember, and I, I know I've told you guys this before, but I remember serving in the army during the Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, Bosnia conflict after flying hours and hours over the city of Birchko uh, in an arbitration dispute or an arbitration resolution movement there. I had been flying for eight or nine hours that day and we finally landed and, and got out of the cockpit and I had probably a hundred pounds of flight gear on and it was a mile plus walk from there to where we lived on the compound and it was so hot and I remember it as if it was yesterday I remember walking that walk back and just hearing God calling me and I, I just remember stopping I stopped right there on the flight deck I removed all of my or I just threw off all of my heavy gear down to the ground and I stuck both arms up in the air and looked up and I said I hear you but I'm busy right now those were my exact words I'll never forget it I hear you but I'm busy right now and I bent down, I picked up my gear, and I took off walking. Let me tell you something, guys. If he had not called again, I wouldn't be where I am today in his service. So believe me when I say from first-hand experience, it's him who calls. It's not us. Okay? He says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you by the way, that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So, I urge you that if he's calling you, to please pay 
attention to that call. Just as Eve was taken from the side of Adam, his rib was taken from his body, so the bride of Messiah will be taken from Yeshua's body. His bride will be taken out from his body of believers from amongst those who are saved. From amongst those who are saved. Meaning that everyone else is still saved. This is not a lost versus justified discussion. This is a focus only on the justified. This is a focus on the difference between those who would say, thanks for the blood, I'll see you in 50 years, and those who would get on their knees and weep at the thought of what the blood did for them and say, even though I can never repay you, how can I serve you today and strive every day to know Him, to grow as, as Paul implores us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. To wake up every day, as Miss Kathy just said, for those of us that have been married for many years and we want to hear the other one say, I love you. He wants the same from you. He wants you to say, I love you. You can do that verbally or you can also do that through service to Him. You can do that by waking up and saying, thank you for this beautiful day. I'm going to read your, your word now. Talk to me. You can do that by sitting there and simply meditating on his name and letting him speak to you. Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought, instead of me coming up with all the words today, Father, I'm just going to sit here and let you speak to me. And just be quiet. Put out everything else and wait. He'll speak to you. He and I talk most often when I go for walks around the neighborhood the books and things that I write he orders them as I'm walking and I come back and I write down my notes the lessons that we give here he orders them while I'm walking he will talk be there with him just as you would be for your husband or your wife or just as you would be for your son or your daughter or your grandchildren or your friend okay but what about this thought for us guys? Guys as brides, something just the same is kind of funny. You know, and I, we, we alluded to this last week. So let's clarify that. The bride in Scripture is pictured as female, though the distinction of his bride being made up of males and females is irrelevant. You knew that already. There is no gender in our heavenly position in Messiah. Jesus tells us that. Paul talks about it in Galatians. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. So, for all you guys who might have been listening to this and you go, I'm just not digging this being part of a, a bride thing. Let me tell you, there's no greater honor. So don't, don't throw it away just because you're a guy. We, before this lesson on the body and the bride, we did a lesson called um, the reprobate mind. It's, it's available online. I urge you to go get it. And it talks about the marriage being between a man and a woman. And we clearly uh, disdain uh, homosexuality, be it men or women. And so uh, be sure that we understand here what we're talking about is a spiritual relationship with Jesus. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we are almost done. So what we talked about tonight, we talked about biblical matchmaking, the Shad Khan, which is actually kind of a review back to last week where we talked about that in Genesis, uh, early parts of Genesis where God created Adam and then created a helper. We talked about the selecting of a bride for Isaac in Genesis 24. Beautiful chapter. I, th I think only second to Genesis 22. So we went back, the background from Genesis 22 through 24. A, another beautiful story there. How the, the Scripture, the Holy Spirit has purposely edited Isaac out. That his being a type of the Son, he is purposely, from the time that he went up on the top of Mount Moriah and acted out prophecy of the sacrifice of the Son, which, by the way, Biblical scholars believe was the very spot where some 2,000 years later another father really did offer his son. It, it, it's believed that it is the very spot where Jesus Christ was offered on the stake for you and me. So we see this picture of Isaac being offered 
And then he's edited out of the picture exactly the same as Jesus when he was offered and he is now out of the picture. And in the meantime, we read of all of the workings of the comforter, Eliezer, the servant, who had charge over all that the father had as he sought a bride. Notice he wasn't seeking anything other than a bride. That shows you where the importance is for the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you folks, if you have a daily or whatever your routine is, if you have that relationship and you can feel the Spirit inside of you driving you on into the service of the King, the chances are very, very great that you are a member of the bride. That's where you want to be. You're winning the race. We talked about the type. We, we exposed you know, the, the entire story, which I just summarized there. And then we talked about its application to us today. So that's all uh, that we have for part two. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is go ahead and move it to our invitation slide. I think that this lesson tonight, this study of Genesis 24 and, and looking at the background of how we got to 24 from 22... And there's a, you know, the, the reason I didn't start at 22 is because the idea here is looking for a bride. So we started at 24 with a servant looking for the bride. But in order to understand all that was truly happening there, we backed up to Genesis 22. So uh, I think it's a beautiful picture. And if it has moved you, if you feel like the Lord is calling you as a result of this message, please, as I, I'm going to move it over to our invitation slide. So as I close in prayer, please read this and then just ask Him to come into your life. Abba, Father, we love You. We thank You, Lord, because Your Word is amazing. Father, what You've given us is incredible. The opportunity at redemption, without which we would simply be lost, Father. When we look at this world today, and we see a lot that are lost, and we see that they're prospering, and that they're happy, and... They have everything that they could need or want and desire, Father, but it's up to us to put our heads down and charge forward, knowing good and well that the time of your vengeance, the day of the wrath of God, will come, Father. And we pray that you will use the time between now and then to continue to awaken those who do not know you and call them into your service, Father, as you deem appropriate. We ask, Father, for a special blessing for those men and women serving our nation around the world in uniform, especially those on the battlefield, Father, who are making it possible for us to be here tonight worshiping and studying you and, and growing, as we've said several times, in the grace and knowledge of your Son as we strive to win the race and to be a member of the bride, Father. And, we ask for your blessings as we go forward this week. Keep us, Father, in safety. Protect us from this world, but give us strength to stand up for you until we meet again. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.